Isaiah chapter number 9. There is a Christmas song entitled, Do You Hear What I Hear? In the opening part of that song, so I understand the two songwriters, husband and wife team who wrote the song, actually wrote the song during the period of the Cold War uh, in the midst of the 1960s. Normally, so I understand anyway, as the story is told, uh, that usually the, the wife wrote the lyrics and he would write the tune. But as he was walking the streets of New York City, uh, this, the song, the lyrics of this song came to his mind. He went home and, and the rest is history. And the song lyrics begin like this. Said the night wind to the little lamb, do you see what I see? Way up in the sky, little lamb, do you see what I see? A star, a star, dancing in the night with a tail as big as a kite, with a tail as big as a kite. And the story goes on in the song, said the little lamb to the shepherd boy, do you hear what I hear? Ringing through the sky, shepherd boy, do you hear what I hear? A song, a song, high above the tree with a voice as big as the sea. And then the shepherd boy carries on the information. Shed the shepherd boy to a mighty king, do you know what I know? In your palace wall, a mighty king, do you know what I know? A child, a child, shivers in the cold. Let us bring him silver and gold. Said the king to the people everywhere, listen to what I say. Pray for peace, people everywhere. Listen to what I say. The child, the child, sleeping the night, he will bring us goodness and light. He will bring us goodness and light. I don't know the spiritual condition of those two songwriters, but I dare say in light of this, the story behind writing of the song, uh, the piece that they were writing about, although granted in the song they gave rise to the Son of Jesus Christ, yet they were looking for a peace that maybe they really didn't understand. Isaiah proclaimed these words in Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the what? The Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. I wonder this morning what kind of peace are you looking for? Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. As he began, John 14, with those very same words. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Peace. Now what kind of peace are you looking for today. I believe that the kind of peace that the world needs is the kind of peace that we find wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. That's the kind of peace that this world needs. They're clamoring for peace. They are constantly trying to meet at the UN and around the world and writing peace treaties and let's try to forge this peace with this nation and this group with that group, and we'll do everything we can necessary to bring about peace. The problem is, is the world's kinds of peace misses the key ingredient. And that key ingredient is the person of Jesus Christ. 
You see, you'll never have any peace in your life unless Jesus Christ is at the center of your life. You'll never have any peace. And the peace that you have as a result of knowing Jesus Christ, you can then turn around and share with others. That, that great vision, that, that great passion that you and I should have as believers. As we examined a, a few weeks ago in Isaiah chapter 53, when we find the crucified Savior proclaimed by the prophet Isaiah, who was bruised and beaten, a shepherd who left all of the glory of heaven and became the one who would be beaten and bruised for you and for me. And then we go to Isaiah 54. In Isaiah chapter 54, there's promise of restoration to the nation of Israel. And then we come to Isaiah chapter number 55, and we find a great proclamation to the Gentiles. That's to you and I. As we read a, a few weeks ago in verse number 1 of Isaiah 55, Ho, everyone that is thirsty, come to the waters and drink. He that hath no money, come and buy and eat. Wherefore, verse 2, do you spend money for which is not bread? Verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And in verse number 8 and 9 of Isaiah chapter 55, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And we talked about the vision that God has for us. I believe God has a, a great vision for us to accomplish, and it's centered in the Prince of Peace. Uh, we have a, a slogan, if you will, here at, at Ebenezer Baptist Church, and it's called a place of hope to call home. I can't tell you how many people have come and visited here and uh, as one of our faith teams has been out or, or I've been out in the community and, and I've had people comment. And they've made this, this comment just totally off the cuff. They've said, you know, when we came to Ebenezer, we felt like we were at home. And when you come to Ebenezer Baptist Church, we want you to feel like you're at home. But we don't want you to feel like you should be at home with your sin. We don't want that to happen. We don't want you to feel like you can be at home with your complacency or your laziness or your lostness or the fact that you have no eternal hope. We do want you to feel like this is a family. But the greatest hope is found in the person of Jesus Christ. And we want to cast a vision that is absolutely and always bibliocentric and Christocentric and gospel-centric. As we shared several weeks ago, the vision that we have, that, that we want to continue to carry out, if it's not heated or heralded, it brings disaster. We also shared that God's vision is always specific to our circumstances, but there's always opposition. And as Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 55, there are some things that are just beyond our comprehension. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the disciples when Jesus said to the disciples in Matthew chapter 28, and then again in Mark, and then you come to Acts chapter number 1, when he says to the disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Can you imagine what was going through their mind? How are we going to accomplish this task? How is it possible that we can take the good news, the gospel of the Prince of Peace, how can we possibly take that and fulfill the vision that Christ has entrusted? How can we possibly do that? But I'm here to tell you today that it's possible for you and I to fulfill the Great Commission. By literally taking the gospel to the entire world, we have that ability literally at our fingertips we can fulfill the gospel, the great commission in this generation. What about when the children of Israel were told to march around the walls and the walls were going to fall down? That was beyond their comprehension. What about when, when the servant was told to, to dip into the Jordan seven times and when you come up, your leprosy is going to be done away with? What about when... Moses was told to speak to the rock and water was going to come forth. Or 
when Moses was told to go to Pharaoh, the, the greatest politician of the world at the time, and go look at Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Or what about when Jesus fed the 5,000 with those five loaves and two fishes? Or when the priests were told to step into the Jordan River, and when they stepped into the Jordan River, when the sole of their foot would hit the water, that the water would part. You see, God's vision for us is far, far beyond what we could ever imagine or think. It seems impossible. What about when Gideon was told to fight the enemy with just 300 men? Or the story of Elisha and the woman who was running out of food and he told her, go and borrow all the jars you can borrow and tomorrow morning they will all be full. You know, just kind of imagine running out of food and someone come into your house and say, well, go borrow all the canning jars you can borrow, ladies, and just set them out on the counter and tomorrow they're going to be full of food. Do we still serve that kind of God today in this generation? Who can do things that we could never even imagine or think possible? Absolutely we do. And the vision that he has given us to accomplish is beyond what we can imagine or think. What about when little David, little tiny David, the little boy, the young boy, maybe 10, 11, or 12 years old, stepped out on that hillside, and there was the giant who was nine feet tall, and all the rest of the army, including King Saul, who was head and shoulders above all the other Israelites, himself would not go and fight the giant. And little David who had already whipped the bear and the lion, went to the brook and he picked five smooth stones. And he went out on the hillside and he said, Who are you to mock the God of Israel? And Goliath looks at him and says, You're nothing but a dog. I'll eat you for lunch. And David picked up that sling off his side and that little stone and he swung it around and around and around and around, and he released that stone, and it hit the giant in the head, and the giant came tumbling down. An impossible feat, an impossible task, yet that young boy had a vision that God had given to him to accomplish a task that everybody else said, it can't be done! And I believe that's exactly what God has called us to do. God has called us as a church Hey, go acquire some property. Hey, build a new building. Go plant a church. Start a campus ministry. Build another building. Expand your ministry. Go reach the 97,000 people that are in a 15-mile radius of this church with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Present to them the Prince of Peace. That's the peace they're looking for. You say, how is that possible? I'm here to tell you it's a possible task. It's our duty. It's our job. Because he's called us to do so. What about reaching the world from the middle of nowhere? Many have said that about us, right? We're a church literally in the middle of nowhere. Where's Maxville, Ohio? I have no idea. But I'm here to tell you, I believe without any question, without any doubt, we can accomplish what God has called us to do we can fulfill the vision and the task that he's called us to do because God is able. In Isaiah chapter 55, I want you to notice something in verses 10 and 11. Not only is God's vision always beyond what we can accomplish or imagine, but I want you to notice in verses 10 and 11 that God's word and vision is always reliable. Always reliable. This past week I was reminded of how great things can be accomplished for the glory of God with just a handful of people who are willing to step up and say, let's go. 
One of our missionaries that we have supported for a number of years had the privilege of meeting with him this past week and, and preaching on uh, seven occasions this past week to about 450 students and adults, a number of decisions for Christ, to God be the glory for this past week. But Marcelo and Gabi Diaz left their homeland of Argentina, spent four or five years in, uh, in Venezuela, and then answered the call to go to Guatemala 15 years ago. And they went to Guatemala literally not knowing anyone. They didn't know anyone. Yes, they could speak the language, but they didn't know anyone. That would be like you taking off and going across the country to Arizona or someplace else, not knowing a single soul to go over there and begin a ministry. And they literally packed up their car, a vehicle, and they drove from here to Guatemala. And this past week, I had the privilege of meeting Douglas. Douglas was the first young man that Marcel led to Christ, and Douglas is now uh, maintenance and director for their camp, a beautiful 32-acre camp facility they have that God has given to them. It's an incredible place in Guatemala, on a lake, beautiful buildings. What an incredible, what an incredible thing God has done. Because someone was faithful in seeing the vision and following through and proclaiming the gospel. And Douglas who Marcelo met at a car wash, came to Christ, and now is a part of their staff members. They have 26 staff members in Guatemala in, for Word of Life. They have 48 Bible clubs. They have 400 Bible club leaders. They have six clubs, Bible clubs in Belize. They have an outreach annually that reaches about 15,000 people in Guatemala. Their camp annually has about 2,500 people. They have a Bible institute with 40 students. What an incredible example of what God can do when it seems like it's impossible. I believe God has something for us to do, and it's always centered in His Word. Look in verse number 10 of Isaiah 55. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, which by the way, we're very well aware of that, right? Rain and snow. This past week, I had much better weather in Guatemala. For as the rain and snow cometh down from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, in other words, you know, here, here's the picture, here's the image, all right? When it rains, I've never seen this, maybe you have, and if you have, get a picture of it, right? It begins to rain, and all of a sudden, er, it stops in midair and goes back up. Have you ever seen that happen? No, I've never seen that happen. It doesn't happen with rain or snow. That's what he's saying. Rain and snow comes down. It doesn't come down halfway, stop, and go back up. No, what does it do? It waters the earth and does what? And it, it maketh to bring forth the bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Now, it's not gardening time right now, but Lord willing, really soon it will be gardening time. <laughs> Have you ever noticed when you plant a garden, what happens when it rains? What happens when it rains when you plant a garden? It seemingly overnight does what? Just pops with life. Now, you can go out and you can set the sprinkler up. <laughs> Sprinkler does okay, but it does nothing in comparison to the rain. Nothing. The real thing is the real deal. Now, I realize that the water that we have that comes through the water hose and all of that eventually came from the rain that goes to the lake, that goes to the pond, that ends up in this tower out here and comes to the house. Okay, I understand that. But there's nothing like that fresh rain. Nothing like it. And it will accomplish things that nothing else can accomplish. Now, I want you to notice the comparison that he makes in verse number 11. Don't miss this. For just as the rain and the snow, he says, comes down, and it waters, and it brings forth fruit, and then seed, to do what? To bring forth more fruit. Watch, verse 11. Do you see what he says? So 
shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return, what? Void. Listen to me carefully. The word of God, when we are faithful at proclaiming the word of God, it will not return void. It was thrilling for me to, to hear the reports on Friday night. I was, I was on Facebook Friday night in, in Guatemala, and they said, oh, 450 or 460 people were here. And I got in late last night, and I came over and, and watched through the performance and went outside, and we had the privilege of proclaiming the Word of God to over 600 people this weekend. Come on! Hey, listen! That's what it's about. It's about proclaiming the Word of God. You say, well, did thousands come to know Jesus Christ? That's not the point. That's not the point. Do you hear what he says? Just as the rain and the snow comes down, so when the Word of God goes out, it's going to bring forth fruit. It won't come back void. It won't come back empty. It's a guarantee. It's a guarantee that God makes and that is our responsibility. In order to accomplish the vision and the purpose that God has for us as a church, we must continually proclaim the Word of God. That has to be center in all that we do. Will we laugh sometimes? Absolutely. I love to laugh. Will we joke sometimes? Absolutely. I love to joke. Will we dress up goofy sometimes? Yes, yeah, sometimes they even dress up goofy. But you know what? At the center of it all must be the proclamation of the Word of God. Because in proclaiming the Word of God, we proclaim the Prince of Peace, and it's the Prince of Peace that will bring peace to your life, no matter your circumstances. He'll solve your problems. He'll fix your depression. He'll ease your discouragement. When we proclaim who He is, because the Word of God will not return void. Look what He says in verses 12 and 13. You see, not only is God's vision always beyond what we can accomplish, God's vision and Word is always reliable, but God's vision is always the best. Look in verse 12 and 13. For you shall go out with joy. Do you, do you, do you see that? Just, just stop right there. Just stop right there. As a result of the proclamation of the Word of God, as a result of the fact that it will not come back void, do you see what he says? You will go out with what? Great joy. There's great joy that comes when the Word of God is at the center of all that we do. How many of you are joyful today? Are you really joyful? I mean, stop and think about it. How many of you have had some rough circumstances over the last month or so? This, I mean, if you've had rough circumstances in the last six months, just stand up. If any, any rough circumstances, any rough, any rough stuff in your life, I mean anything rough, anything, just look around. Look, look, just look. Everybody look around. You see, that's at least... Well, that's at least 95% of the people. We've had rough stuff in our life, right? Did it stink? Yeah, it was horrible, wasn't it? Some of it was really bad, right? And, and did, you, did you wonder, am I going to be able to get through it? Did, was there moments in your life when you thought, oh, this is really discouraging and bad and down? Listen, listen. In those times, force yourself. Listen, force yourself. Drive yourself back to the Word of God because it will not return void. And when you do, you will go out of your circumstances no matter how difficult they are. You'll go out with joy. Woo! <laughs> you'll go out with joy. The circumstance, listen, the circumstances are still going on. The tough stuff is still going on. But you can rise above your... And I'm not talking about... You can be seated. I'm not talking about... 
uh, Norman Vincent Peale and, and the power of positive thinking. I'm not talking about that at all. All right? If you want to think positively, that's great. I, I'm talking about something that's far greater than the power of positive thinking. I'm talking about the power of the Word of God. And when you soak that into your life, you will absolutely go out with joy. But notice what he says next. Look at it. And you will be led forth with what? Peace. You know, just... Everybody go... Don't go to sleep. <laughs> Listen. When the Word of God goes forth, it will not come back void, and you will have joy, and you will have peace. Now watch. And the mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the fields shall do what? Shall do what? Shall do what? Come on. Come on. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart. Down in my heart. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Down in my heart to stay. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. And I'm so happy, so very happy. I've got the love of Jesus in my heart. Wow. You know what? Something about that? That is absolutely contagious. That's real contagious Christianity. That's real contagious Christianity. You see why? Because the Word of God is at the center of your life. You've poured the Word of God in. You're speaking the Word of God. And as a result of it, there's going to come joy and peace that can't be explained. And people are going to look at you and say, what's wrong with you? Well, let me tell you what's wrong with me. Let me tell you about my circumstances. My wife has cancer. My wife, they thought, had cancer. I'm battling cancer. I lost my job. And the list goes on and on. But, you know what? I've got joy. Amen. What? How, how is that possible? Well, let me tell you how that's possible. Let me tell you how that's possible. Because I know the Prince of Peace. I mean, we have opportunities every day, every day, to proclaim Jesus Christ. We just, we just quite honestly get so busy and so caught up in our circumstances we don't take advantage of them, right? Huh? I'm, I'm guilty. Verse 13, Instead of the thorn shall come up with the fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the Lord for a name for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. You see, God's vision is always the best. His vision for our life is always the best. If we'll follow what He has for us, it's the best. What about you in your life? What's, what's, God, what's God's vision for you? What is it? No doubt some of you are like, hmm. I, I, well, I, I, I don't know. Never, I, you know, go to work and pay the bills and cook supper and pet the dog and Love my wife and children, and, you know, and die and go to heaven. Yeah, have you ever stopped and asked God, say, God, what, what is your vision for my life? What, what do you want me to accomplish? You see, I think sometimes we take 
God's vision and his plans for our life and we lower them down to a human standard. When he's got far greater things for us to accomplish, we just don't stop and take time and consider what it is he has for us to do. So how do we fulfill God's vision? Well, I think we need to understand some things. We need to understand our context, our capacity, our call. When, when, we, when we know what God's vision is, we need to communicate it. We need to communicate it credibly, carefully, clearly, creatively, continually. But listen, we must complete it prayerfully, progressively, and patiently. But above all else, in order to fulfill God's vision for us, we must rely on the Holy Spirit of God. You see, if we rely on our own intuitiveness, on our own ingenuity, on our own abilities, then we, quite frankly, don't need God. We don't. Because we can just do it on our own. We desperately need the Spirit of the living God who dwells within us to empower us to accomplish the task and the vision that God has before us. And that's not just true for us as individuals, but that's true for us as a church as well. There, there, are, there are things that I believe God has for us to accomplish as a church that are, that are just beyond our imagination. I really do. But if we try to accomplish it, it won't work. But if we rely on the Spirit of God, it will work. Because in relying on the Spirit of God and we rely on the Word of God, guess what? It will not come back void. It won't come back to us void because he's called us to accomplish a great task. There are three things I want you to see very quickly in closing that I think are very important. Listen carefully. In order for us to accomplish God's vision, it requires sacrifice. It requires great sacrifice in three areas. Listen. First of all, it requires people resources. That's hands and feet. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. There, there, I, I had no greater joy, this is, I'm being totally incomplete, as a pastor, I had no greater joy than to have nothing to do with the nativity thing, the live nativity. That was, that was great joy for me. I have nothing to do with it. Somebody said, can we do it? I said, yeah, that'd be great. And guess what? Y'all did it. That's hands and feet at work. I don't know, maybe somebody can tell me how many were involved in the production. Who, who's here that knows that? Anybody? Beth, Tina, Heather, how, how many? 75, 100? Close to 100 of you all made this past weekend possible. That's, do, you, do, you, do you realize how significant that is? That's taking the necessity of people, resources, to accomplish the vision that God has for us to accomplish. That's incredible. Listen to what he says in Luke chapter 10 and verse 2. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into the harvest. Listen. There are many, many things that God wants us to accomplish, but it still takes people resources. That means all of us. All of us, every one of us, doing something. If you're not plugged in into doing something in this body, then find someplace, ask somebody, say, I don't know, what can I do? Just ask somebody. And if they don't know the answer, go find somebody else and say, what can I do? If they don't know, find somebody. Find somebody who can tell you that you can do something here at Ebenezer Baptist Church because we want everybody doing something. You know what happens? When everybody does something, it makes the load a lot lighter. Two heads are always better than one. Many hands make light work. 
And if we're all involved in the task of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, listen, the harvest, the harvest is already ready. All we need are some laborers who say, hey, hey, I'll go. It takes people resources. Secondly, it takes prayer resources. That's your knees, by the way. Say, I, I, I can't do much. I physically am not able to do a lot physically. Hey, listen, one of the greatest resources you have at your disposal is that of prayer. Listen to what it says in Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 and 3. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Colossae, continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. With all, pray also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds. Paul says, hey, listen, pray that more doors will open so that we can continue to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, this great mystery of Christ, in more places. He says, listen, I'm in bonds. I'm in prison as a result of preaching. Pray that more doors will open. Listen, church, we need to be praying. I'm asking you to pray. Say, God, what would you have us to do? What are some other ways that we can reach more people? There are still people within the 15-mile radius of this church. There are still literally thousands of people within the 15-mile radius of this church that are still lost and have no hope. We need people resources. We need prayer resources. You know what else we need? We need pocketbook resources. Wow, I didn't mind the people resource one. I didn't mind the prayer resource a whole lot. But now you got it in my back pocket. Now we got a problem. But we need that. We need that. We do. We, we need money. We need money to accomplish the task. We, we need all of us to be faithful in giving. Whatever God has blessed you, then give. If, you're, if you've not practiced or not practicing regular giving, ask God. Say, God, how can I become more faithful in my giving? Oh, Lord, I, I want to become more faithful. As we close out this year, ask God. Say, God, can I do something great at the end of the year? Or, God, I want to begin the first of the year by being a faithful giver to the, to the ministries here at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Listen to me carefully. And it's not just about what we do as a church. It's not just about keeping the lights on and having heat when it's warm and air conditioning when it's cold and sitting in a nice padded chair. That's not what it's all about. Listen to me. It's about what I saw this past week when I saw... Literally across a platform that was as big as this platform, hundreds of young people on their faces before God, surrendering their lives to Jesus Christ and saying, yes, I'll go and serve and help to reach Guatemala with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why it takes financial resources to accomplish the work of the ministry. It's not just about us. It's about out there. There's a world of seven billion people Seven billion people. But this I say, he that soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly. He that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly out of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Said the night wind, to the little lamb. Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? Wow. What a task. What a vision God has given to us as a people to accomplish. We want to reach people. We want to teach people. We want to grow people, and we want to see everyone worshiping the true and living God. Say, reach people with me. Say, reach people. Reach people. Say, teach people. Teach people. Say, grow people. grow people. Say, worship a living God. God. That's our purpose. Say, reach people. Reach people. Say, teach people. Teach people. Say, grow people. grow people. Worship a living God. God. That's our purpose. That's our purpose. Where do you fit in? What's your part? What's your job? Guys, hey, that's, that's a great segue. Guys, you were handed a piece of paper this morning. For your, you're supposed to list your, your spiritual gifts, some way that, that you have an ability to serve, right? 
You've got one of those. I didn't plan this. That's just the way it worked out. Hey, guys, listen. Fill it out. Get involved. Men. I'm talking about men. How many men do we have? We have any men here this morning? Men, if you're a man, stand up. I mean, if you're a man. I want to see some men here. I think men here. I mean, look. Men. I'm all men. You know. All right. You know what? You know what thrilled me? I'm, t- I'm telling you the truth. You know what thrilled me this past week? At a camp, we had about 350 students, about 150 uh, um, young adult and adult leaders. There were more young men campers than there were girls. Now, you go to an average camp. Here in the United States, a Christian camp, I promise you, there are way more girls than there are guys. That was thrilling to me. Look, look, just look, look around. Just look, look around. See, see all the men? There's men. And you know what we need you to do, men? We need you to step up to the plate. Say, okay, yeah, I can, I can do something. I can do carpentry work. I can do plumbing work. I can work with children. I can do evangelism. I can lead an athletic event. I'm good with computers. I, I, you know, I can cook. I can clean, I can sew, uh, you know, whatever it is you can do, all right? Yeah. Yeah. If you're single and you're looking for a good godly woman, put that down at the bottom and we'll take those applications, all right? Pass those along. Hey, listen. There's, there's, a, there's a job to be done. Do you understand there's a job to be done? You know who needs to be leading the way? Who needs to be leading the way? Yeah, we do. That, that, I'm not talking about being a dictator, okay? I'm, I'm talking about being a leader. That's what we need. We need some men who will be leaders. Now, ladies, I want you to stand up. Stand by your man. Listen carefully. I would be amiss, I would be totally and completely amiss if I did not say this. <laughs> I miss my wife. She was in Kansas the week before, and then I was in Guatemala, so I haven't seen her for two, two and a half weeks. And I'm here to tell you, I'm here to tell you, I realize some of you aren't married. I, I realize that. But guys, do you, those of you who are, you know, you know who your best cheerleader is. You know who your best helpmate is. You can't accomplish what you accomplish without. Now, I must say this. You'll never do anything for God. Never unless you know him. Now, you might be here today, and you might say, well, yeah, I go to church. But no, do you, I'm not talking about going to church. I'm not talking about being religious. A lot of religious people in the world. I'm talking about do you know him. There is a vast, huge difference between being a church person and knowing God personally. Big difference. Do you know him? Do you, do you really know him? Are you just playing the game? If you're playing the game, I can tell you where you're going to go based on what God's Word says. If you know him personally, I can tell you where you're going to go as well based on what God's Word says. Do you know him? If you know him, if you know him, do you see what I see? Sin 